Yes. Hi. How's it going? How's it? Uh, 9.09 AM. How are you guys feeling? Awake? A little pretty good? All right. Awesome. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about uh, web application development workflow, uh, which I think is a really important thing. Inside this conference, we're hearing a lot of things around technique and technologies. Um, but I want to spend a little bit of time and focus on how we're actually putting these techniques to use and what is kind of the day-to-day -day iteration churn kind of development process uh, that we're using to, to do this kind of stuff. Uh, so really this is kind of workflow and tooling support for front-end developers. So I wanted to ask you guys some things, so raise your hands. Um, who uses JS Hint or JS Lint? Two, that's fine, that's good. Cool, okay, awesome. It's uh, a lot. Who has automation for testing or deployment? So it's not you doing everything, it's kind of some of it's happening automatically. Yeah, good, good, good. Um, and who uses one of the following, Yeoman, Live Reload, or Code Kit? Cool. All right, awesome. So pretty much a good 80% of the room has uh, the use, makes good use of tools to support the workflow. And I think this has kind of been a change that we've seen over the last few years. Um, maybe, like three years ago, we didn't have the kind of tooling support for front-end development that we do nowadays. And it was more about knowing the differences between browser uh, compatibility issues. And now we're able to work directly with tools that kind of handle that trivia for us. And we're able to operate just focusing on what's unique about our app. This is um, Rands, who used to be an engineering manager at Apple. And uh, he said, as an engineer, there's a short list of tools you must be rabid about. Um, and he was focusing on uh, his, his kind of terminal, his, his text editor workflow. And he just, you know, be pa find what you like, be passionate about it, um, and care a lot. And so today we're going to walk through a few things. Uh, we're going to walk through the shell, um, some SSH stuff, project configuration, collaboration standards. Uh, I'm going to talk about Yeoman for a little bit, do some testing, style iteration, good stuff, some cool things in the dev tools, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, all right. Yes, good. OK, first thing with uh, your shell. So commonly, uh, if you use you know, um, OS X and you start up terminal, this is what the shell looks like. Uh, it has, by default, your machine name is like uh, Paul Irish's MacBook. And then it'll have this little colon and a tilde, and then your name again, just for repetition. And it's just, there's no color. And it's just kind of depressing. And, and you know, like, this happened uh, like two weeks ago. I was at a coworker's machine. And he was, it was a new machine. And he was getting set up. And I was like, OK, let's go and you know, uh, install Homebrew. And he brings up the terminal, and it's this. And I was like, OK, I really don't want to have to be the guy that's like, OK, I'm going to go fix your machine for you and make it way better and do it the way that I do things. But like, I needed to, because this is just depressing and sad. You don't want this. So, Prioritize making your shell feel good to you. And it's not that hard. So this is, uh, this is my bash prompt. Um, there's many out there. This one's pretty simple. Um, and it does a few things, but I'm just going to show it to you right now. Cool. All right, so let's see. I'm just going to jump around a little bit. Uh, hop in over here. Touch a new file. Um, pop up here. How's it going? And uh, cool. So there's a few things going on here. First is that I'm getting the context of exactly where I'm operating. I'm also getting information about uh, my repository status. So over here, I was in the master branch. And over here, I was in the HTML5 devconf branch. And then I touched a, a new file. I'm getting the immediate feedback that my repository is a little dirty. Um, so I don't have to type, keep typing git status all the time. And then I SSH'd into a, a, a box that I have. Um, and now I'm getting my username and a reminder of what machine I'm logged into, um, just so that I can differentiate when I go between tabs. And the other nice thing that I have um, going on is that uh, up at the top, this is, this is a thing that I'm really keen on. Um, 
the name of the title bar represents the folder that you're in. And this is really good, especially when you have a lot of different tabs, you're able to see at a glance as far as what context you're operating in. All right, so good stuff there. There's a big community of people making these kind of customizations uh, on GitHub. Uh, these are the, the dot files repositories. And so you can check out um, a lot of them. Really comprehensive stuff. All mine are up there as well. Uh, I'm going to walk through a few of my favorites. Uh, so these are just fa favorite aliases. Just a second ago, you saw this. Um, I'm using uh, a little uh, directory jumper called Z. And this, I can just type in any portion of the folder name that I want to go to. Uh, and it'll just jump right into it. Uh, similar auto jump, which is J, is another one. Uh, quite similar. Server is good for firing up an instant web server. So if I come back and exit out of this box and then fire up server, we immediately start up uh, a little simple HTTP server and it opens up that uh, location in the browser as well at the same time. Kind of a good combo. Uh, this is a fun one. So I recently found how much I like this. So normally cat will do something like this and you'll just cat out a file and it'll look okay. Sometimes you hit the hot corner of your screen and then it locks your screen and then, okay, good. <laughs> should disable that. Um, but uh, another alias is uh, C. So instead of catting out, I'm going to see it out. And so this actually uses uh, pigmentize so that I can cat things kind of basically through uh, syntax highlighting, uh, which just makes for a much more nice experience. Uh, GZ for gzip size. So I can verify that. While, in fact, the original size of my HTML file is around 127K, after gzip, we'll be looking around 24K. Good for just kind of on the fly checks. Um, and one I'm actually, I haven't yet found the perfect one yet, um, an extract function that normalizes between different types of, of archives, between like, you know, tarballs and zips and 7Zs and all that. I, I don't remember the options and the flags for the tar binary. Uh, and I haven't found a good one here, so if you know a good one, let me know. Because I, I suck at extracting archives. I'm just terrible at it. All right. Um, another thing, and this is okay, not necessarily important, but it just is a lot of fun. Okay. First things first, we do a little homebrew. We install a little app called ImageSnap. Then we set up a post commit hook on a Git repository, just a four liner. And what this is going to do is take a picture of you using uh, your built-in camera every time you make a commit, which is really nice. Um, it can be also like really sad. This is Alex Sexton. <laughs> really just sad. It must have been doing like some document write hack for IE8 or something. It's just like, no. But then it also can capture really successful moments when you're like, yes, we got that feature in. Boom, to the repository. Uh, this is um, uh, Aaron Forsander, who's a developer in, uh, in Austin. And he just took all of his Git shots and then put them into a single uh, time-lapse video, which is kind of cool. And it's trivial to, to, to put this together. Yeah, you can spot there was a short trip to Dublin in the middle of that. That happens. All right. Uh, on to SSH. Now, for the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to, the background I'm going to use is silky smooth hopping. Uh, so if you SSH into a box um, and you commonly encounter a password prompt um, because it wants you to log in, raise your hand. Yes, good, that's fine, no problem. Um, I just wanted to, because this is, I, I, it took me a, way too long to realize this. 
Um, so the uh, SSH public key that you made to use GitHub, um, you can use the same thing. Uh, you can copy it to your clipboard. This is a little one-liner to copy whatever to your clipboard. Um, and then once you actually log into the server, just toss the contents of that public key into the authorized key file on that server, and then you'll never be met with this password prompt again. Nice. It's like this small thing, but it really just makes it a lot more powerful. Now, that's a small one, but we can actually make this a bit better. There is a configuration file for uh, SSH. So while we could, let's say, we were logging into this server a few times in this specific port, and a good way to shorten that up is just to make it a little bash alias uh, so that we can SSH dev here. Uh, we can actually just add this into the configuration for SSH itself. So the config file looks something like this. Uh, specify the host name, the port, and then from there on, we can just uh, manage it there. We can also specify identity files, so just point to the public key. So if you want to log into the same box um, with different users, it's really trivial. Uh, I've never before put an XKCD in one of my talks, but this came out yesterday, and I just, so I just had to. I'll give you just a moment to read it. I'm not going to read it out loud. So, uh, yeah, so this is actually, uh, I mean, one of the additional benefits, in addition to just the developer ergonomics of I log into a box that doesn't prompt me for a password, is uh, when you're sharing access to a server, don't you know, create a login and password and email it out. A much better way is just to say, hey, send me your SSH public key. They can send that to you over email. It's fine. It's no biggie. Um, drop it in, and then they can log in, no problem. Um, so it's just a much more secure and functional way to, to handle this. Um, once I got this going, then I discovered, oh my god, SCP. SCP is so nice. Um, now I can just do this right from the command line. So this is in my dot files. Uh, it's a little function where I take whatever file I have and I toss it up to my web host. Um, and then right after that, I copy the new destination file uh, URL to my clipboard um, and just tell, tell me that so that I can, you know, I download some awesome, hilarious image and instantly send it up so that I can share it with everyone else. Um, small, handy, kind of trivial, but kind of fun. Deploying on push is something that um, I've spent a lot of time looking at. And this is probably the best uh, solution that is not hyper-specific to a specific architecture. Um, so you're, you're sending. You're working on a repository, but you want to deploy the contents of that repository uh, whenever you push up to it, and whenever anyone else pushes up to it, too. <clears throat> and you want that to just happen transparently. So first, throw git on your server, generate an SSH key on, the, on that server, um, and then you add a, a deploy key to GitHub. And there, so there's two ways that you could have done this. You could have added the server's SSH key to your user, but you can also just add it as a deploy key to, for a specific repository. And the difference here is that uh, deploy keys are specific to a repo. So let's say that the server was compromised. Um, someone could not use, someone uh, could only affect that specific repo and not all the repos that you, your user, has access to. So it's a bit safer. Um, then this is a, this is a, a short PH, deploy PHP, uh, very readable. And these are actually the notes that I'm cribbing uh, these bullets from on this, on this gist. Uh, last piece is you add a service hook. So on uh, GitHub, you can just, there's all these different kinds of service hooks. And um, you point to one. One of the other hooks that I use a lot is uh, IRC. And so on all pushes, um, a little bot will come in uh, one of my IRC channels and just say the summary and have links to it. Uh, it's really nice in groups for collaborating. Uh, so you can just have a hook. And from then on, when you push to your repo or anyone else does, uh, GitHub posts the uh, JSON summary of it to the deploy, and your server pulls down the latest. Everything's gravy, and you're good. All right. 
<clears throat> Moving on to um, kind of project configuration type stuff. So, <coughs> sorry. Uh, so this is uh, a pretty exciting uh, spot where we can actually, editor config allows us to specify um, some white space policy that we might have. So if you, let's say that your project, uh, this is a tabs project, or it's a spaces project, and it's a four spaces project. And, and yes, we do want a, a new line at the end of the file, and we want no trailing white space. So you can define that declaratively in a dot editor config file. Uh, and then there's also plugins for every editor imaginable that can read in that file and apply those rules to, uh, to your project. And so the cool thing here is that you're able to uh, set up a style guideline for, uh, for the repository and have all the editors do the work for you so that you're not keeping track of the standards in every place. Another similar one is JS Hint RC. So if you're familiar with JS Hint, um, JS Hint RC takes the configuration that you're using and just makes it into a single configuration file that's, that's for that repository. So let's say these globals are allowed, and then these options are allowed here. So that's what that looks like. But the cool thing here is that tools like uh, your editors, uh, JS Hint integration, Grunt, other tools that run uh, a linter against your JavaScript can read that file, and, uh, and everyone else working on the same repository is, is evaluating against the same code quality guidelines. So the really nice thing here is that you're able to standardize your style guide um, as, as a team and agree on what these rules are. But more importantly, you're able to toolify it. And I think that's really important. I think that all code style rules should be backed by tooling. You shouldn't have uh, something that is just a rule that people find out because they file a pull request and you're like, yeah, nice pull request, but we actually need spaces inside the parens or something like that. Um, and it's just, it's not a fun experience when you're contributing to a project and the code review uh, is, is style nits, right? So you use tooling to, to defend code style. All right, so I'm gonna bring up Yeoman real quick. Uh, right after I check my slides. Yeah, good, okay, great, good, good. All right, so uh, who has um, seen, uh, seen a little bit about Yeoman, or gotten a view of it, and who has used it? Cool, okay, awesome. So uh, Yeoman is a project that I've been working on uh, with a team at Google and also a team of external contributors um, to kind of try and codify a lot of the workflow best practices that we've seen over the past few years and try and make that into one kind of one project that captures this. So essentially it's an open source set of frameworks, tools, tools that exist out there, open source projects that exist out there with the goal of building compelling web applications. And so it has things built into it like authoring, ab authoring abstractions, linting, um, and its priority is good developer ergonomics. So it's built on uh, tools like Grunt, uh, also things like Compass and SAS and CoffeeScript, first class module support with uh, AMD and required JS, and we also have an experiment for ECMAScript 6 modules. Um, if you want to kind of play around with that, it was just added to ECMAScript 6 this summer. Um, and you can author in it and it'll work, kind of transpiles it down. Uh, Bootstrap, HTML5 Boilerplate Modernizer, Twitter Bowers Package Manager, the Mocha Test Suite, Phantom JS, Headless WebKit, um, and a very rich build system. So I'm gonna show a little bit of what Yeoman does. We're going to hop over here, and I will make a new folder and call off Yeoman init. All right, so uh, first it's gonna ask me a few questions. It's gonna ask me, 
would I like to install Twitter Bootstrap? Yes. Uh, and the JS plugins? Yes. Uh, am I going to use AMD modules? Yes. And I'm going to skip ECMAScript 6 modules for now. And that sounds good to me. Whoops. OK, cool, cool, cool. All right, so I answered those questions twice. And then, uh, and then as a result, it created a bunch of files. Um, so it scaffolded out uh, my files. We have Bootstrap in here. We also have a Mocha test suite. And so let's just start it up. I'm just going to get a hint. Cool. Uh, so there's a, just a few commands in, in Yeoman itself. And I'll kick this off. So Yeoman server does a few things. It not only starts up a little preview server and opens up a tab, but it also is handling a watch with recompilation built into it. So I'm going to bring this down here, switch over here, and open up my editor. Now. Cool. So let's see, body, background, papaya whip. It's a fantastic color. Oh, and so faint. Oh, teal? OK, that's much better. Uh, so I'm just hitting save, and over here immediately, uh, my watch task is noticing that the file has changed. We're running Compass um, on, on my styles and then doing a live reload on the page itself. Uh, and I'm going to add in a few more things. Let's say I'm going to take actually the container of the page and I'll just set it to 500. This is a, yeah, cool. This is a new tool called Emmet. Uh, which is made by the guy who made Zen coding. And he's like, we should do the same thing in CSS. So you do um, W500 tab, and it expands out to width 500. And then you do something like transform uh, with a dash. You hit tab. You get some of this. It's pretty cool. Uh, and I'll just add in some little bit of rotation. Yeah, sweet. Now, that's pretty rad. Um, but we can do a little bit more inside Yeoman. And so I want to kind of walk through exactly um, what we do. But first, one of the priorities that we have with this project is that we want to be able to continue to improve it based on how people are using it. So part of the project is actually a small tool called Insight. And what this actually does is it's instrumentation that users can opt into that reports what these commands are. So um, I just ran. Uh, Yeoman init and Yeoman server. And these can get reported up to Google Analytics if you're OK with that. And, um, and then we get a, a pretty cool report. So this is the report. And this is publicly available. Um, and so this is not website data, but this is um, traffic from traffic. It's use of the actual command line tool. Um, and so you can see this was launch. And then it kind of like slowed down a little bit. And people were like, well, not so sure. And then they're like, OK, maybe it is actually OK. So that's pretty fun. Um, and so these are the kinds of things that, that people are doing, um, running Yeoman Server and Yeoman Init like we just did. But also starting off projects with Angular and Backbone or um, adding handlebars to their application. So the cool thing here is we're able to see kind of what the most popular uh, JavaScript libraries that people are adding to their application are. And also answer questions like, how long does it take for people to upgrade to the newest version of Yeoman um, after we ship it? So it's nice to have that tooling in there. But at the same time, um, one of the other things that we've done is we've added auto update to it. So the tool is itself, command line tool, updates. Um, and this is based on semantic versioning. So uh, major, minor patch, if the patch version goes up, we're just going to update you automatically. Um, but if it's a minor or major uh, change, we'll prompt you and, and ask you if you're cool with that first. And then Yeoman is really meant to not only provide you a good workflow, but be a kind of 
community watering hole as far as figuring out what the best practices are for application development um, and kind of have consensus on this. And so it might change over time, um, but we want to be able to uh, identify exactly how we're going to do things with, with the whole community involved. One of the things that we did inside the developer community recently is Uglify JS, which is um, one of the most popular JavaScript minifiers, was doing a, a campaign to raise money to, to write the new version. And so Yeoman and actually Chrome Developer Relations was happy to contribute to that campaign. Um, and one of the things that we're very excited to see is uh, it'll be gaining the ability to generate source maps when you uh, minify JavaScript, which, is, which provides a lot more rich uh, debugging and, uh, experience. Now, I wanted to talk about package management and kind of what we're doing inside of Yeoman to handle this. But first of all, package management is really important because client-side dependencies are a chore. And I can say this because uh, in part of my 20% time at Google, I work on the JavaScript library CDN. And so we actually have a good idea as far as of all the jQueries that people pull down from that CDN, how many are actually the latest version uh, versus an old version like 1.4.3. Um, and a lot of times people you know, don't go back and update. And some of that is due to because I'm not so sure if that jQuery plugin that I was using was actually tested on the new thing, or the jQuery UI is 1.6, and does that work on the jQuery 1.8? I don't know. And so there's this dependency management that is not exactly clear, um, and, and you have to figure that out on your own. So what this happens at an ecosystem level is that common code gets duplicated. Um, even just writing a project, like shipping a library and saying that you depend on jQuery is becoming almost uncool these days. So uh, everyone is writing their own small little Ajax helper or you know, their underscore equivalent. And that's not good. So this is leading to library fragmentation, disjoint communities, and I think it can get better. Um, a lot of times I look at kind of the node communities, uh, package ecosystem, or Rubies, and I'm just like, I really, I want that. Like, Ruby community is, is like very active about learning about new packages and finding ways to integrate it so that you don't have to maintain all the code in your application and you can leverage other open source projects that write that for you. So we can address this. And I'll show you a little bit about what we have inside Yeoman for package management. So, all right, cool. So inside Yeoman, we're using Twitter Bower which uh, is a package manager, package manager that came out uh, just about two months ago. And so I'm going to first search for all the backbone packages that are available inside the registry. Uh, and there's quite a few of them. Uh, the, the normal backbone is here, but we also have a lot of libraries that sit on top of it. So in this case, I'm just going to install uh, backbone uh, RPC. Now, the cool thing that happens here is that I want Backbone RPC, and this is an add-on to facilitate RPC with Backbone, clearly. Uh, but it depends on Backbone, obviously. And Backbone depends on underscore and jQuery. So this is actually fetching all these for me. It's recursively handling my dependencies and installing them. And now uh, it's pulled all those down. I can verify what exactly is now in my repository. Uh, with backbone underscore uh, and jQuery. And I'll also do one other pretty cool thing. So I'm going to also pull down uh, another app, uh, another package called backbone local storage. <laughs> yes. So this is really fantastic because a lot of times in your app, Keeping track of all the new versions of everything and making sure that you're running the latest ones with any sort of security issues or just speed improvements is kind of annoying. Uh, so in this case, we can actually read out, uh, we can get a listing, the fact that this dependency, I have installed 1.2.6, but 1.3.3 is now shipping and available. So I have this information right here displayed to me so I can go and make a decision on how I want to handle resolving that. All right, 
Next is generators. And this is a pretty cool feature that we didn't get to talk uh, quite a bit about so far. But generators is actually what I used when I said yeoman init, and it brought all, created all those files for me. But it's a totally configurable process. So we can start out new projects with a number of different kind of boilerplate templates, but it's a lot more customizable than that. So uh, we can pull dependencies and filter down, you know, I want um, backbone, but I really don't want it to test suite, or I, I, I don't want to you know, pull down the minified file that's normally included in the repo. It can wire things up to make sure that your uh, required JS configuration is actually now referring to uh, this dependency that I just pulled down. <clears throat> and then we have subgenerators for augmenting the application with new models, new views. And I'm going to show a little bit of this. The generators that are available uh, right now look like this. Uh, we have uh, support for your common uh, MV JavaScript MVC libraries, Angular, Backbone, Ember, um, Backbone Boilerplate. And we're going to show a little bit of what it looks like with the Am uh, Angular generator. So come back here. I'm going to make a brand new project. And I'm going to kick off the whole thing with an Angular generator. Now it's created a bunch of files. Uh, and so let's start this up. Yeoman server. Nice. All right. So. All right, so we have a basic look. Uh, it looks like we don't even have default styles. Um, but it's booted up, and this application is, is, has Angular available. And I'm going to pull up uh, one of its controllers. So this is, uh, this may not have been clear. This is one of the controllers for Angular. So you can actually see it's defined in an array of things. And if I augment it um, and hit Save, again, Yeoman is detecting that the file changed and we can uh, take care of a reload just for us. Now, I'm going to add I'm going to add a small little piece of functionality to this application. Let's see if I can do it quickly. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Nope. Not like that. Yes. Good. We see, yeah, one of the things I like here is that I have JS hint running live against my, against my code. And so I'm getting these little white highlights. And if I look down at the bottom, uh, it tells me that I have a missing semicolon uh, so that I can make sure that I correctly add a semicolon and deal with that. Uh, so now I'm going to hop over to the view that controls this. And let's see if I can deal with this. All right, input ng model, new awesome thing. And then a button, hi, ng click add. That's right, yeah, yeah, I think. Let's see, let's try it out. No! What do you think? Yeah, this scope is totally undefined. Oh, oh, this is what you're saying. Thanks. Yeah, that's nice. OK. <laughs> that's fine. All right. So this is pretty rad. Aside from my bad scope, this is, that's why there were white borders around it. And I was like, why is it still yelling at me? I put the semicolon there. No, you're totally right. OK, cool. Good. 
So now I've just added interaction to the application um, in a quick short time. So uh, this is a kind of rapid iteration that Yeoman is, is providing. All right, let's come back here and move forward. So in summary, uh, scaffold out new projects and augment them very quickly. Live recompilation of SAS of CoffeeScript, uh, live refresh of that action, um, AMD module first class support, and uh, even, I didn't get to show this, but running unit tests, running your, your, your Mocha or Jasmine test suite inside a headless web kit automatically for you, and a very, very robust build script that does all the things that you'd want to. Um, so good. So when 094 is out there, uh, you can check it out more on Yeoman.io and also the GitHub project where there's a, a big community um, having good discussions there. So I'm gonna move on to testing. Uh, there's a few things in here that I think are really rad. This is Local Tunnel, a uh, quick little app that you can just take and say, I want to tunnel out my local port 8000, and it just creates uh, a publicly accessible version of that. Um, this is good not only for just sharing your local host with another developer, but also if you have um, an application working in local host here, you want to test it on your phone, something like that. Testim is a really exciting project uh, that I've been watching closely. And this is a, uh, able to tackle running uh, your test suites in the command line via browsers, via headless WebKit. Uh, so I can have my test suite defined inside Mocha, for instance, um, and then run it all in kind of this tabbed interface where I can get my success reports or my, calls, or my uh, backtrace on any sort of error. Uh, it handles launching Chrome and Safari and Opera um, all for you and kind of does, does awesome work for you and even has good continuous integration setup. And lastly, on device testing. If you're doing mobile work, um, dealing with the uh, different devices that you need to make sure you have compatibility for, course is pretty challenging. Um, but the story there, beyond having these devices yourself, is getting better. Um, you probably are aware of Browser Stack, um, where you can log in and test desktop browsers, but they also have a lot of mobile browsers um, uh, through emulators, which is not as good as the real thing, but it is still pretty good. So you can just log in. Um, they use a kind of a flash uh, virtual thing to test, test that out. AppThwack uh, has a new service that's available where you can take uh, a site and say, I want screenshots of this in mobile browsers. And it's actually going to take screenshots of it in about, I think, 30 different phones in all the browsers available that it can. Uh, so Opera Mobile, Android Stock Browser, Dolphin, uh, Firefox beta, and Chrome on Android. So this is really good, especially if you have a content site where you need to make sure that the compatibility is really strong across a number of different combinations. And lastly, there's a, a new kind of ecosystem of open device labs where you can just go to a place in person, and they'll have a bunch of devices, and you're welcome to kind of test things out there. Uh, there's a great one in Portland, there's one in Oakland, there's one in DC, and there's a lot in Europe. And this site, uh, LabUp, is focused on identifying um, all these places, pointing you to them, and providing support for, uh, for those labs so that they have all the devices available um, and kind of work with browser and device manufacturers so that they can get good ones. All right. Last thing on testing is just to have fun with it. Um, this is a test reporter made for Mocha. Uh, instead of the normal pass, fail, whatever, uh, as your test suite goes through, you get a nice Nyan cat, which I, that's pretty lovely. All right, cool. All right, uh, on to style iteration. I like to spend a little bit of time on this because we do spend quite a bit of time tweaking our styles and, and going back and forth. So I'm going to do a little bit of demoing, and hopefully, hopefully it works out. You there? 
Yeah, OK, cool. Now, all right, so this is HTML5 Please. I'm running it here in localhost. And first thing, I'm going to go over here and just pretend like you never even saw what I did. <laughs> Great. All right, so if I bring up the DevTools and I select uh, this section here. Now, uh, we have this H1, we have some styles, and I can click over to the source file, exactly this part of the source file, and I can do a live edit right here. And so maybe you want to kind of tweak some changes here uh, and just have you know, full live um, edit as if, it's a, uh, as if it's a text file or a text editor. Now that's pretty cool, but if you notice actually, this was compiled from SAS. And so it's kind of silly to be editing this um, when the original source is in SAS. And so uh, a lot of people have asked about a better way for handling this. And so this is actually the first time that I'm gonna preview a feature in the Chrome DevTools to deal with this. So uh, right now I just hit question mark which is a keyboard shortcut for shortcuts, but I'm just using it to get over to here, which is some fun experiments. Uh, so the one that I'm looking for is support for SAS. And so I'm gonna show you what it does, but it's pretty cool. All right, I'm gonna refresh the page, bring back up DevTools, and reselect this H1. Now, there's a slight difference in what we're seeing here. We still see our, our rendered styles, and we can edit these, but we're actually pointing to the SCSS file right here on the right-hand side. And if I click through to that, I'm now looking exactly at my original SAS file with my extends and with my nested selectors. And if I actually enable, let's say, library load, and then I make a change like, uh, let's augment this, this text shadow. I right click and I hit save as, and I just have to do this once, just once. Uh, I hit replace, and now I get a change. So this is pretty rad. Um, I can be able to make changes on the fly inside my SAS and get immediate feedback uh, without having to go back to a browser or worry about that. Uh, just to make it a little bit more fun, I'm gonna drop the current text shadow and turn it up a notch. <laughs> <laughs> Semicolon. Yeah, that's pretty hot. Uh, it's just abusive text shadow uh, with sass. <laughs> that's good. Cool, so now we have, uh, finally, inspection um, and support for, for SAS. And this is kind of in progress. A, a little bit more of the feature is gonna uh, be developed before it's ready to ship. Uh, but I'm really excited about where it is right now. All right. Coming back, I'm gonna show off live edit. So, bring up WebStorm. Uh, WebStorm is a fantastic uh, IDE for doing web development, uh, and they've quickened their release cycle, so I think they release every six weeks or so, um, but they're very closely tracking what the community is doing, so they have JS Hint, they have SAS, um, things like this, so it's really exciting. So the first thing that you'll notice is that as I'm selecting, uh, just I'm, I'm literally just clicking around in my HTML. But Chrome is, is aware of that, and it's, it's highlighting these elements as I'm clicking around. And now if I turn on Live Edit, and I'm gonna bring this over here, turn on Live Edit, uh, any change that I make inside WebStorm will just be represented immediately over inside Chrome. This is really cool. I think, yeah. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to bring up Guard. 
Guard is kind of the command line version of a lot of this sort of thing of just when files change, monitor it because I'm gonna do some action. The slides that you're looking at, uh, I actually used Guard to develop them. So I'm gonna bring up uh, my slide, my slides, cool. So here's my slides. Uh, I wrote most of them in basically Markdown, uh, and then I wrote my styles in, in SAS. So what I have is actually, uh, this is my guard file, and I can basically just say, hey, whenever the slides markdown changes, I wanna run this little bit of Python that's gonna take care of rendering out the markdown into my HTML, deal with the templating, do that. Whenever my style sheet uh, inside SAS changes, please run Compass against it. And so I could just do that, um, and over here, all I run is guard, and it just takes care of all the rest for me. So it's kind of a nice uh, low-tech way of handling that kind of power. A few more things inside Chrome DevTools that I wanted to show real quick. Uh, we have a lot of people asked about a multi-line console, and I want to show you kind of how this works now. So if I open up sources, you see we have this new navigation panel uh, where I can collapse my views, bring this back. But you'll notice this third guy right here, which is snippets. And so snippets uh, is basically a multi-line console, but persistent. So uh, I can create a new item here by just right-clicking and calling it whatever.js. Uh, and then let's say I want to uh, just write out any sort of function. Uh, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Console log success. And then bring up the console and we hit play, just evaluate it. So we have syntax highlighting uh, and, and it all works. But it, since it is persistent, you're able to retain a little bit more of the, the common things that you use. So uh, this here is a script that I uh, typically like to use so first, it's a small little get script handler uh, just to, you, you pass it a, a URL for JavaScript and it gets it. Um, and then inside, we're gonna do something. So first, I'm just gonna make sure that this does indeed work. Yay. Okay, cool. It is working. Now I'll put back the good stuff. Oh yeah, that's good. Oh, that's real good. Oh yeah. My favorite part about Cornify is that it adds these adjectives in front of all the headlines. So fun, HTML5, please, and lovely animations, happy audio, wonder, it's, it's just the best. So good. All right. Uh, the other thing I, I should point out, actually, uh, on this topic is that because these are treated as basically JavaScript files that operate inside the context of your application, uh, we can do a little bit more than you normally would be able to do with a multi-line console. So I can set a breakpoint and then uh, hit play. And we're, we're totally just broken. It's broken like a normal breakpoint where I can investigate what's going on here uh, and see what's up. Uh, and if you notice, there's a new feature just to remind you that your page is indeed paused. You're not gonna be able to, to, to do anything with it. Uh, so don't try. Okay, yes, good. Now over uh, for mobile, there's a few new features that um, you might not know about. So this right here is a, a multi-touch finger paint demo that I worked on with some friends, uh, but it only works with touch. And so I'm actually clicking right now, but it's not doing anything because it's, it's simply only bound to touch start and touch, uh, touch move. So I'm gonna bring up the file. I just hit Command O for this little shortcut guy. Uh, and down here, you can see we're just binding to touch start and touch move. And normally that's a pain and you're like, well, I gotta open up my device and test it over there. But nowadays, we can come over to our overrides panel inside the Chrome DevTools settings. Um, by the way, I am using uh, the question mark to bring this up, but I could go down to the bottom right where this little, there's a little cog icon to bring up this. 
Now in here is emulate touch events. So now if I select that and refresh, I can now get my touches. So this is huge for dealing with, with mobile development so that you can be able to maintain uh, your development on the desktop uh, for a little bit longer. But let's see. Uh, you'll notice that on this page, uh, when I change between here and here, we have looks like a CSS transition and probably media queries that's optimizing this for a little smaller screen. Let's take a look at how I'm doing that. I'm going to hit command, uh, command option F for search across all files. And I'm going to search for at media. See what media queries are active. Click over to this, and OK. Cool. So we have a little media query, and at max width of 780, it's making this happen. Now, normally, let's say I'm going to go in here and change this to max device width. Max device width is specific to devices, um, and you can't emulate it on the desktop uh, normally, but now, inside the same view, you can just click off device metrics. And then you can even come up here to the, the user agent spoofing and say, oh, I'm going to spoof, let's say, uh, next S. And it automatically populates the device metrics with the, the metrics of that specific device, um, which in this case is 480 by 800. And so it resizes the context of the page. And that's why this gray is here. Uh, so we can kind of test around. Um, and, and any of those sorts of device media queries will be emulated, uh, as well as, in this case, the user agent. And some other cool, great stuff in here, like overriding geolocation and device orientation, is really handy for testing. All right. This is not the end of my talk. Uh, OK. Ah, good. Great. OK. <laughs> it's close to it, though. All right. In closing, um, find your tool chain. Be proud of it. Don't. This is a, this is a great site called Setup where you can catalog what software that you use. Um, also, like things like Chrome extensions and Sublime Text plugins that, that you use can just be populated here. Um, and there's actually a client, there's a, there's a little app that indexes your system for you so that you don't have to do all the work. It's really nice. Um, be proud of the, the tools you are. You, know, um, you should feel rabid about the tools that you're using. And the other thing is also don't be content with the tool chain that you're using. Think about like the possibilities. Um, there's, a, there's a number of workflow resources out there um, for optimizing your workflow and other, other experiments people have tried and written up. Um, so I'll send out the, sl the slides link later, um, and you can click around these. So your job as a developer isn't just to develop, but to continually learn how to develop better. So be open to kind of what you could be do. Be impatient with your workflow, with any sort of repetition, and think about crazy ideas that could happen. Uh, recently, Pamela Fox said, Imagine if we had code coverage for front-end integration tests. So all the things that users are doing on the site, we know that all of those are captured by our Selenium tests. That would be cool. Um, I don't think we're very far off from that. Things like the GitHub uh, commit status API, which was recently added. So what this does is, let's say, this is a pull request on Modernizer. And uh, it's a small fix. And we're getting this feedback here that it's good to merge. Um, Travis, for continuous integration, has taken this patch, applied it to the host repo, and run the test suite. Um, and it's green uh, after doing all that work. So uh, that's a really powerful um, continuous integration setup. And I encourage you to think of other ways to kind of augment uh, and create a, a richer continuous integration story for your code. So in summary, if you're repeating yourself, chances are someone's written software to automate it. And if they haven't, you're about to, and you should. Um, 
one feature that is brand new. Uh, it is a big deal. I'm going to show it to you now. It's, I'm really excited. Styled console messages. Guys, this is so good. All right. Uh, console logs, right? I'm going to open this guy up, bring him down to the bottom, and we'll jump over the console. Now, if I print these out, yes. Nice. Boring one. Oh, good looking one. So basically, all this is is just a little bit of style uh, to apply over here, and we apply it with a C. Firebug already has the support. It's now in Chrome DevTools. Um, and in fact, I think I might actually have another one over in snippets. Ah, uh, yes. OK, so here's another, another short message. But this time, we're going to take a little bit more CSS and apply that, maybe some text shadow, some good stuff. Still output it here. Let's see how this goes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's good. All right, guys, that's it for me. Thank you.